This is episode number seven of The Jason Croft Show, where we show you how to build a movement around something you're passionate about. This is not business as usual. Host Jason Croft is a video marketing strategist driven to grow your business. He grabs top CEOs, startup founders, even sales and marketing rock stars, throws them in a moving vehicle, and forces them to give you their most valuable tactics and business insights. So sit back, buckle up, and hang on for The Jason Croft Show. Welcome to episode number seven. If you haven't done so yet, make sure you check out my last two episodes with Ken Ku. He filled us in on Bridge Alliance, which is what he's created to tackle the incredibly large and complex need and profitable opportunities of merging large corporations and innovative startups. For the show today, we've got something a little different. This interview was done at The Grove during Startup Week in Dallas, Texas this year. I had the great fortune to interview Jillian Jordan in front of a live audience at that beautiful co-working space. Jillian has launched the Great Seed Bomb. Her goal is to build a nationwide movement around the massive importance of bees and other pollinating insects. But this isn't some pass out flyers and let's chat about it education session. Jillian is all about action. Find out how the Great Seed Bomb is empowering large numbers of people to affect major change. Welcome, everybody. We're talking to the wonderful Jillian Jordan. Uh oh, I see someone in the back that should not be here. <laughs> Welcome to us. So let's get talking. Sure. Let's talk the, the great seed bomb. Okay. Yeah. A little bit. Let's tell, tell us what that is, and then I want to dive into your past. Yeah, sure enough. They got you there. So yeah, tell, me, yeah. tell me a little bit about it. So it's um, deceptively simple, but um, it is a bike ride for Bees and Monarch. It's a fundraising bike ride. Um, and we distribute, uh, which is like, as we're riding our bikes, we toss seed bombs off the bike. Um, and it has compost, clay, and uh, milkweed seeds, as well as n uh, native non-GMO wildflower seeds. Awesome. It's to Why? Combat, oh, it's to combat uh, habitat fragmentation. Um, okay. So what this is mean? an issue that came to me. I was working at UNT actually. I was the I was the director of advertising, and I was doing a research series with our environmental program, which okay. was actually pretty strong. And um, I met Jessica Beckham, who is a PhD student, um, and she told me, uh, you know, as I was interviewing her for this ad, that there was um, a lot of issues. Everybody was concentrated on the honeybee situation. Um, but truthfully, uh, native bees and bumblebees are also struggling. And they pollinate sometimes three to ten times more effectively than honeybees. So if you don't mm. want just honey, um, mason bees, solitary bees are also known as, and bumblebees, they're, you know, there's tons of species that are native to the U.S. Mm. Um, and they're struggling uh, with habitat, not just um, for nourishment, like in the nectar and, and with wildflowers, but also with homes. So for instance, nature takes care of that naturally. You'll have a flood and you know a tree will fall down and we'll instantly manicure it because uh, we're used to manicured things and we're like, we're gonna do a cleanup, so we'll pick up all the old wood. And truth be told, that's actually a really good habitat for our mason bees and bumblebees. Uh. Um, so uh, now they have these bee habitats that you can get for your yard where you know it's just a series of tubes and they, they build their homes in there. Um, but yeah, so habitat fragmentation is just a lot of, uh, we do overdevelopment. We, our yards are actually a problem. Um, they're not, you know, suitable for native pollinators in many cases. Um, and they take up a lot of water, you know, there's, there's ongoing issues. So. But, but what's the, what's the big picture of so what? So because what? Because oh I gosh. think, I think that, you know what I mean? Right. I, and yeah. I'm just now, even in the last few months was the first time I really got that picture at all right. to even, oh, this is something that's okay. serious, Yeah, right? no, so one thing is we're dealing with 60% less bees than we were in like 1967. Mm. So even though our population is more than doubled, um, our food sources, one out of three bites, you've heard comes from bees or, you know, pollinators. Oh, wow. um, so when you have 60% of those, at, you know, no longer there and dying from all different types of things, not just, you know, the colony collapse disorder, we, we talk about the mites and the, the herbicides, uh, glyphosate and such that um, is, you know, there's some pesticides that are taking them out. But in addition to that, it's, I mean, hmm. It's a scary thought, not just that our population is growing, we need to provide more food, but it's kind of sad to think that our food sources would be less diverse than they are now. Um, and I think that would affect like our health. 
sure. in turn. Well, um, not so just that's why it's important. less diverse, but also less real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and actually yeah. natural, organic. And right, exactly. And, and there's an increase in the, in the buying and selling of organic products. So people care. Um, the community is yeah. starting to listen now. And then the monarch is 90% is, uh, decline. Um, so that's staggering. You know, there's about to be a mass extinction um, in terms of the monarch. There's been gradual increases over the past three years because I think mm. people are starting to hear about this issue and they're starting to pay attention to it. Um, even the White House put out uh, the, the task force for pollinators. Um, so there are definitely, people know about it, politicians know about it, um, but we don't want to see you know, something as iconic as the monarch die off. Uh, sure. So I think that's symbolic to a lot of people. It's one of the, the it's the insect that migrates the longest distance. Um, at least there's, one, I think there's one other, but it's one <laughs> of the, definitely right. one of the top three. And um, so losing the iconic monarch, um, they're good pollinators as well, but um, all the bees, all the other pollinators, like we talk about um, beetles as well. There's a lot of beetles, um, hummingbirds, bats, these are all pollinators. So if we're affecting them with the stuff we're spraying, um, it, it's a concern. Well, that, I mean, that trickles up. It's not a trickle, right? But it goes, I mean, that takes your, that's your whole ecosystem, right? It, it, I right, mean, it's not exactly. just no, yeah, that these, particular these species. These are small things. It's, it's weird to think that the hu like human beings could die off because of something so small. But it's right. a trick, you're right, it's a trickle effect. Right. You know, we lose the bees, we lose, um, you know, food and such for other other insects and species in the ecosystem. Um, you're right, so it affects yeah. from the bottom up. Right. And they're an indicator species, so it's, it's showing that when these things die, it's an indication of a larger problem. Gotcha. Um, it, you know, something I've been, that I, before I started this, you know, my background's in marketing um, and advertising, and I did nonprofit PR. I mean, before I started this, I, d I don't think I realized the severity of the issue. And one of the things that was a red flag for me is that glyphosate, which is commonly, you know, Roundup, it's found in Roundup, mm. um, is in 75% of rain samples, and it's a known carcinogen. Uh, it's been directly linked to things like breast cancer. So this is a health issue. Right. Um, so wow. the reason we're doing this, you know, a bike ride that distributes sea bombs is not going to save the bees. What I'm trying to do is is actually bigger than that. It's, it's it's awareness of the issue. It's awareness of how we can help the issue. Um, it's act. It's activism, uh, sure. essentially. So I've marketed it in a hey, you can. This is scary to read these things, but you can actually do something tangible and fun. Bring right. your family out. But you know, really, we're pulling them out also because they can learn a lot about these issues and how they're all connected. Well, and it's something that's very actionable, right? It's something that. Tangible, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you can hold it in your hand. Rather than just this big, overwhelming, yep, that right. sounds pretty horrible, and you right. go on with your day. Yeah, and, and, I, and this organization is not about that. Uh, yeah. I actually, I don't think that's effective for pulling masses at all. Right. I, I do think with my background in marketing that marketing is everything. I think that's the key to, like, the way you package something can turn people off or on. Sure. So, and I was very cognizant of that. Uh, I knew the branding would be important. I knew the way we talked about it would be important. So it was not this, you know, bees are dying, oh my God, we're all gonna die. I didn't wanna right. do that to people. I wanted to be like, look, this is an issue. Have you felt concerned about this too? Join your tribe, let's go on a bike ride. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's do something, at least a little something about it. Right. Um, yeah. And, and I, wanna, I wanna dive even deeper into it because there's so many aspects like that, that that are so smart and so well put together. Um, but just as, as a flow for the evening and everything, I wanna, I wanna go back to your background, what sure. led to this even more. You started you know, talking about that at UNT, yeah, what sparked enough. that. Yeah. Um, and then towards the end, we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll just have this conversation go as long as we go and then open it up to, to questions if you're yeah. up oh, for absolutely. that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And uh, so anything you've been dying to ask, Jody and Jordan, <laughs> get them ready, get some <laughs> juicy questions. <laughs> Um, so, so take me back. So you have this this concern. When when was yeah. the the first moment that it was? I could actually do something about this, and what and what that could be. Um, hmm. I okay. So in in 2012, I um, I did a big trip around the world. Um, I was I just got my MPA from Masters in Public Administration from okay. UTA. 
And um, during that time, all my projects were around sustainability um, and around uh, you know, green projects. So um, when I did my trip, I decided to do some volunteer work. So I, did, I was a sustainability intern, an international sustainability intern in Thailand. Oh, wow. um, so it was north of Chiang Mai, I was in the jungles, and I was living with a host mom that I grew very close to. In fact, we still talk today um, uh, frequently. And um, being there for just a month even was enough for me to see how close she was to her food source. Uh, she would literally tell me, we're gonna go have dinner. And we would go through backyards in, in the village um, and just like go to certain neighbors' houses and she'd be like, oh, here's where we can get some mango leaves, pick the new growth. Um, here's where we can get uh, dragon fruit. Here's some passion fruit. Let's get all this stuff nope. together. Were the neighbors aware that she was oh, yeah. taking their food? No, okay. yeah, I was just no, making this sure. Is, this is like a common okay. thing. Like they would come into our yard all the time and pick what was, it's called pot cut. It's a pot cut. Uh, it's kind of like a spinach. Okay. So we would have folks come into our yard and, and take all that. And um, so yeah, they were very, they shared. They had like a sharing community. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, uh, saw how close they were to their food source. I, I told her about how we're not quite like that in the US and I found that fascinating. Um, and then I, she worked for the city. So she was a city official and I would go to training sessions with her and the cities would teach each other how to make money because they didn't have money coming from the Thai king really to do projects. They'd be asked to do mm. these things by the Thai king and the Thai king would be like, well, figure it out, you know, um, <laughs> in some cases. Um, but for instance, like they did these large scale compost operations and created like, like they showed each other how to, how to, you know, do a vermiculture project and sell the compost tea to the community in order to make money to do more compost operations. So cool with their ways. They were really good with that farming communities and whatnot. Organic was very important to them. Everything was organic. Um, so one thing I learned in one of these meetings was that there was a company coming in and they were essentially patenting their biodiversity. Um, and the Thai King came down with an order that they needed to have a seed bank started and they had no way to do this. So one of my jobs was to find out a way to raise money uh, for their seed bank. Um, and I, I learned that that company was Monsanto um, mm -hmm. and we had to uh, essentially fundraise to create the seed bank. So that's when I started becoming fascinated in the power of crowds, because Thai people, they will work together. So I noticed the way they work together, and I gave them um, a report and an instruction sheet after all this research on how to do a crowdfunding campaign in order to get the money. Because the Thai community cared about this issue, they cared that their king put down this order and they really wanted to fulfill it, so um, they were working towards a crowdfunding campaign. So wow. they wanted to crowdsource the issue. Um, I, I'm not sure where the seed bank went. It takes a little bit longer, you know, than a month to, to yeah, get there. Yeah, I was there. wondering, yeah. Right, but so when I got back to the States, um, I was so dead set on, you know, continuing environmental work. I had already worked for the Environmental Defense Fund down in Austin for three months. Um, and I, I was like, this is my passion. Like, I'm being called to this. I'm reading clean energy technology stuff for fun on the weekends. Like, this is weird. <laughs> so. Um, I uh, ended up working for the Climate Institute out of DC for a while and, and talking about um, regional mitigation strategies. So what does that mean? It was a combination. It basically, it's like they would pick certain locations where there are tipping points, like the Himalayas, for example, or mm -hmm. the Arctic. And they would capitalize on the biggest actions you could take to make a dent, the uh, biggest impact. Okay. So um, uh, one of them was uh, short-term climate forcers, so essentially soot. Uh, was a problem when people had their cook stoves, um, so they started switching out cook stoves with clean, clean oh cook yeah. stoves. Um, yeah, so things of that nature. I, I guess it was a combination of all of this that made me come to this idea. Right. Um, well, it's all very empowering too when it's you're in the middle of it and you see firsthand in Thailand or and and even then all these other steps. Oh, I can actually do something. Exactly. And I don't think I was, I got to a point where I was like, I can't just, I'm going to die doing this. Like that's how, <laughs> like I got back to Dallas and I was like, that's it. Like I'm gonna do environmental work even if I have to create my own organization to do it. And that's wow. essentially what I did. Um, so. And, and why was that? Why, why not 
I mean, did you did you go through a period first of like I, I'm going to join with yes. someone else? Or? Yeah, I was trying to be an entrepreneur of sorts, mm -hmm. and I did want to bring the ideas and the experience I, and skill set I had to an organization to do it. Um, it, it took a while, especially in Dallas. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, to be honest, and um, I, w I wasn't. I actually I went to Texas Trees Foundation. And the CEO there was like a real inspiration for me because I, I told her about an idea I had. I'm like, look, you can see income inequality from space. Let's do something about it. And she goes, funny enough, Dallas doesn't have that problem because she's like, South Dallas is just fine when it comes to trees. The North Dallas sector, section is where we have, you know, like overdevelopment and uh, heat index issues and or, or like heat islands and whatnot. Um, so she, she goes, look, can you move? She's from Minnesota. And she's like, look, can you move to Minnesota and people will take you right in, you'll find your tribe? Yes. She's like, but they need you here. She's like, mm. Dallas needs you. Um, so I'm not originally from here, I'm from upstate New York. Um, okay. But so I was like, I'm accustomed to having natural beauty and loving it and protecting it. <laughs> so that's what I can bring to Dallas. Um, and I was small potatoes, of course. You know, I came back and I'm like, okay, I don't have a job. I just traveled the world. Um, but I really want to do something. Um, yep. And learning about you know Jessica Beckham's research and then I was volunteering with the Brit the Botanical Research Institute of Texas they're awesome they're in Fort Worth and um, you know I was reading botanical journals from like the 1600s and building seed bombs with kids on the weekends and watching the light bulb with the kids just from like rolling a little bit of mud in their hands <laughs> and they're like oh so I throw this in my backyard and stuff grows I'm like yeah you throw a couple back there and one of them or two of them is probably going to grow into something. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's an ancient agricultural method. It's not a new thing. Um, but it's fun, and it's easy, and it's tangible, and everyone can do it. So one day I had an aha moment <laughs> <laughs> watching CBS Sunday Morning, because it's all good with Charles Osgood. Um, he is totally my answer I love that man <laughs> so I, I was watching that and over coffee uh, I had actually built um, a company called hub and spoke collaborative which was crowdfunding consulting and it it was uh, I was going to have a co-working space similar to this one in Fort Worth um, that was social enterprise and social entrepreneurs in the co-working space since we don't have that out there but then it turned my attention turned to this project more so okay. um, so I was like what if you know, we did an event, and like Color Run makes 90 million a year, right. which is absurd, absurd. <laughs> right. And then they have Warrior Dash, uh, which makes I think 75 million a year. What if we were to turn that on its head and make it a social enterprise and make that money go to these organizations, hyper local, that right. are doing habitat restoration work? So that's a great. That's a great insight to that because I've been watching that for the last couple of years these it, I mean it's a fad really it is. I mean yeah. it's, it's insane yeah, oh yeah you got to grab onto it now and, and I know that and yeah. even like looking into it it's like well okay is there a charity component no no those are for do profit do you get yeah. anything no <laughs> you just run and throw yeah. color around yeah people fa pay 50 bucks I am guilty to 2012 no, when color run first came out I'm like okay uh, cultural appropriation of the Holy Festival. I guess I'll do that. Um, so I did it, and I, I noticed that people were willing to pay fifty dollars, um, but I didn't like the way it was run and how this money was not going back to you know charitable organizations or any um, kind of or I mean, any. And I'm all yeah. for. I mean, yeah, they're geniuses. Do right, it. But right. so I'm like, what could we do with ninety million coming in or seventy five <laughs> million? Not not to say like. Sure, <laughs> wow. but, but tapping uh, into that. Yeah, but tapping into that model mm -hmm. and then just adding an educational component to it, which this, this does. I mean, each stop even has a water sponsor, which is a free sponsorship, but I want you to bring an environmental learning activity. Mm -hmm. So we have stuff for the adults and stuff for the kids. Um, and, you know, you teach about, you know, zero escaping in your lawn and um, having an, a pollinator garden and or uh, having you know the bike economy like teaching folks that bikes uh, are my heart and they can solve a lot of things um bikes are actually really good for the economy because they people stop three times more often riding through a city on a bike um and so you buy a lot more things things become hyper local um it's community building when you see folks on bikes 
um, it, you're not separated by like car doors anymore, you know? So you'll stop and wave or you'll, you'll chat with folks more. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, you know, health conscious. It's also, uh, car, you know, it saves carbon from lack of, you know, the transportation taken away from that, like driving cars all the time. So it's, it's teaching about bike economy. It's teaching about like weeds can be beautiful. Uh, milkweed, a lot of folks think they're kind of ugly when they don't know what they are. Right. But we have no monarchs if we don't have those because the larvae are completely dependent on milkweed. Mm -hmm. um, makes them taste bad to predators. Like they, their larvae eat all the milkweed and it, yeah, essentially keeps them alive. And um, native is so important because a lot of folks have been planting tropical, for instance, tropical uh, flowers and such, and monarchs love them. But what they'll do is they'll stop and feast a lot and they won't move on. So that's caused problems in the migration oh, wow. and the biodiversity of the offspring and such. So mm -hmm. that's been an issue. Um, it's all these little things that I never knew about that the deeper I dove into it, the more I was like, we could teach people all of this. Um, and if you, know, if you teach people, they learn to love something. And if they love something, they learn to protect it. Right. Um, so there's a big educational component so describe to me the, the actual project itself. I want to make sure everyone's on board knows what that that is, what the bike ride is. Oh, you're, okay. you're, you're yeah. talking about pieces of it. But what is the, the big picture there okay. of it? Okay, you do 50 miles on a bike, and you uh, ride on, right now we have trail systems, but it'll probably end up like on highways and such eventually when we can you know, scale. Mm -hmm. um, and you throw uh, like regional, a regional seed mix that's approved um, we have a seed expert on hand that approves those. He's from Leela, the Louisville Lake Environmental Learning Area. Um, he, they were one of our beneficiaries at the last ride. So this last one was in Fort Worth. Uh, Fort Worth was excellent for this. Um, we went right along the Trinity Trail. Um, and it was, you know, seven miles there, seven miles back, so about 15 miles. Well, seven and a half miles. And um, they... Uh, each stop had like a learning area. So we had somebody from the National Wildlife Federation teaching about monarchs at one of the stops. Kroger was giving out um, organic apples and bananas and such, uh, coconut water. <laughs> I don't think that was organic. Um, and then uh, you'd fill up on the seed bombs again. So you kind of toss them from, we had like a fanny pack. <laughs> and uh, it had our I'm logo. In. Yeah, I, a fanny pack. I mean, it was I'm a T-shirt with your logo and a, a T-shirt with our. And we have like organic shirts this time around. Um, and then I'm learning more about the vendors. And um, <laughs> so you uh, toss the sea bombs from your bag, from your bag, and then you refill um, the bucket from the buckets that are gotcha. all along the route. And um, at the end, there was a party with vendors that were sustainable vendors like Green Mountain Energy and Earth Day Texas and things of that nature. And um, we even had like friends at Tandy Hills which taught about how they are going, they're going about like native restoration mm -hmm. projects that they're doing. Um, they're, they have the bio blitz um, coming up here on Earth Day, uh, which is counting biodiversity. And um, so the ride itself uh, is fun and does something where these things will grow. Um, it had milkweed seeds as well but there's double impact because the money then goes to 50% of all the money we made, not after expenses or anything, but half that money was split and went off to um, Louisville Lake Environmental Learning Area, RACT, which is River Action for the Trinity, um, which also throws seed bombs at some of their events, and um, LILA, so Louisville Lake Environmental Learning Area. These are all organizations that are actually doing habitat restoration work, so there are boots on the ground. I don't think this organization will ever contribute to a large nonprofit. And the reason I say that, they can get, like, NWF can get pretty good and pretty into the nitty gritty. I really like the way they do things. So, like, they got the Million Pollinator Challenge, and it encourages folks to turn their lawns into a, a certified wildlife habitat. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes I think the administrative costs, which is why I'm such a social entrepreneurship fan, is that administrative costs sometimes get in the way. Like, I feel like these organizations mm -hmm. get too big, and they're not as nimble. So this is focusing on those organizations that are boots on the ground and a little more nimble. This is great so far, but I have broken this interview into two parts for you in case you need to jump back into life. But if you're ready for more with Jillian right away, including the Q&A we did with the audience at the end, jump into episode eight right now. I'll see you over there.
Thanks for listening to The Jason Croft Show. Head over to thejasoncrofts.com for all the show notes, links, and special offers mentioned in the show. Also, if you've not already rated our podcast in iTunes, we'd love your support. Please leave a review and the star rating that you think we've earned. And don't forget to subscribe. We've got more incredible guests coming your way. We'll see you next time for business, breakthroughs, and being better on The Jason Croft Show.